Oh Lord, beautiful Father. I thank you right now. I thank you for seeing more in me than I ever saw myself. I thank you for humbling me. I remember being a young man and standing before you, Father God, and laughing at the people that would cry and would say, why are they crying so much? I didn't know you then like I know you now. The question that I have today is, why aren't more people crying because of what you're doing in our lives? The fact, oh Father God, that we can walk out of here and shout on the name of Jesus and not be martyred. The fact that we can leave out of here and shout on the name of Jesus and have no one come in our home and kill all our family members. So as the young man that used to sit in the same church and laugh, at those that were crying, again I ask, why aren't more crying? Because of what you're doing in our lives. There is not a point in time when I begin to speak about what God is doing in my life that I cannot shed tears. How many of you know that the young man that you saw be in this pew right next to you lost his father at the age of two? How many of you know that the young man that was sitting next to you lost his mother at the age of eight? How many of you know that the young man that was sitting next to you used to sit on the balcony edge in New York and used to want to just jump out? But God, mm, but God. So again I ask, why aren't more crying? Why aren't more pushing their pride aside and just shouting on the name of Jesus right now? I don't know about you or your relationship with God, but when I begin to speak about him, the, mag the magnitude of God, I cannot hold in the excitement that I have about God. I must say thank you. And if he could do it for me, why can't he use me to bring others closer to him? It wasn't until I got older and more matured that I understood why he allowed me to go through the things that I went through so that I could stand in front of you today and just testify of how good a God is. Those of you that, that study your word, remember when Philip went to Bartholomew, they say we had found the Messiah. Bartholomew scoffed and said, can anything good come out? If Jesus could put himself in that place where he was judged before he could even do what he was going to do, what about us? The fact that we know him. What is he going to do to us that we have him to hold on to? So the message that I want to talk to us about today as we are all preparing about our New Year resolution is called a New Me Resolution. A New Me Resolution. How do we renew ourselves and reconnect back to God? How do we concern ourselves with the matter of God? You know, an analogy was given because nowadays we're so concerned about offending people, about what people feel, about how they'll react, so we conceal our faith around them. But an analogy was given. If you saw your brother or your sister standing in front of a bus, would you not push them out of the way? Mm. So all these false religions and false gods right now that are being lifted up and we're not sharing the gospel, the enemy, the bus is going straight at them. Mm. And by us not confessing the word of God, we are just sitting there watching them. Yes. Watching that bus go towards a brother or sister whom we claim we love. We pull ourselves out of the way 
so the bus don't hit us. But yet we'll watch them get hit by the bus and we call ourselves Christians. Maybe I'm just talking about myself. Maybe everybody in here does do what God asks of them. Maybe, I'm, maybe I fall short. But I want you to truly examine yourself. Are you doing all that God wants you to do? Are you fulfilling your purpose? Some of us, we were raised up in church. We know all the songs, we know all the hymns. We paraphrase the scriptures. And we go through life living on the strength of yesterday. We don't commit like we used to anymore. We're so consumed with the things that are going on around us. Instead of devoting ourselves to God and we are living on the strength that we had yesterday. <coughs> Let me tell you, when I was 23 and I just met my wife, I used to hit the gym like I don't know what. Two kids later, 10 years later. The weight that I was lifting 10 years ago is not the weight that I'm lifting now. Because I'm no longer in the gym like I used to be. So those of you that think that you could take on the enemy with the same with the same attitude that you had when you were saved and continue strolling through life and no longer committing yourself like the way that you should. Let me tell you the way that you were lifting, the way that you used to be able to defeat the enemy, you no longer will be able to defeat when he comes and attacks because you're no longer lifting that weight. You're no longer exercising. Maybe you are, maybe it's just me. But how many remember David hiding in the cave? Hiding in the cave. Saul, why are you persecuting me, he said. Then he cut a piece of his robe off. He showed forgiveness. Did he not? He showed forgiveness. But then we turn around a couple years later. David was protecting Nabal's flock. Not directly, but indirectly. He sent his men to get something from Nabal. And Nabal said, who is this David? I ain't giving him nothing. I don't know about you, but the rest of y'all may be like me. I would have attacked like David was about to. So on one hand, we have mercy. Picture that. The younger David is stronger than the older David. Right? So on one hand, he forgives and cuts off a piece of Saul's robe and lets him go and humbles himself. But on the other hand, he was ready to go and defend his name, his honor, because he was disrespected. Isn't that us? <laughs> Test yourself. Test your spirit. Are you living today with the same strength that you had yesterday? And that's between you and God, but that's what I'm here to ask you today. Amen. And if you're not, maybe you want to take this journey with me on how we could be a new me. Amen. And have a new me resolution. And how we could stick to it. No. As we mentioned, we are under attack. Are we not? And maybe again, we, we, we figure that we're not because we're not being attacked by Boko Haram. On my church in last week, at least now we're informed that um, there was a member there whose aunt, nephew, and niece village where it's at in Cameroon because they profess to be Christians. And the father and everybody else that was inside that village had to run for their lives. Now here she is safe in America. And there was her family being attacked. And two of her family members did not make it out. So again, how many know that we are under attack? Are we a body? Or are we individual body parts? 
I ask again, are we one body in God or are we individual body parts? Are we praying for those that are being persecuted every day? Or is it too inconvenient for us? Is it an inconvenience? Is, are you going to miss your show? Are you going to be late to a dinner? Is that the case now? Is that our reality now? That prayer no longer works. That prayer is something of old. Prayer was good when it saved you, but now that you're saved, you no longer need it. Let me tell you something. James 4.17 says, If any man knows the good he ought to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. I'll say it again. To anyone who knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. So I'm guilty of sin. And I acknowledge that because I know it is only through God my Savior that I can be saved. Yes. I look at myself a sinner because once I stop looking at myself as a sinner, I start to take on the, 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 um, the same mindset that Eve had when she bit into that fruit. That I will be just like God. That I don't need God anymore. So I don't want to bite that truth. I don't want that intelligence. I want to accept that I have shortcomings. Because when I accept that I have shortcomings, I can look at my brother or sister and have empathy with them. I can feel what they're going through. It makes me then take time to pray for them. To intercede for them. To call them throughout the week. How many times has the Spirit spoken to you and said, call this brother or sister and we just push it to the side? Hmm? How many times the Spirit comes and gets you in the middle of the night to say, get up and pray? Or we just flip one over? Do you not know that the Holy Spirit loves you more than you love yourself? He is trying to save you. But there's a work for you to do. You can't have faith without works. But it won't be the works that saves you. You know, a lot of times we, we uh, get ourselves in church and we try to do all these things because we want to we wanna get ourselves saved. But our faith dictates our character. Pardon my son, y'all. <laughs> so again, I want to look at a few things that maybe it's just me that I need to do. Maybe you all already got it. That will, again, help me to have a new me resolution. See, the first thing that I think we, we fail to do in our church nowadays is truly comprehend what God has done for us. <clears throat> we feel as though we can repay him for what he's done. Am I lying? That's what we say with our actions. But I want to paint a picture for you on it of how impossible it is to repay God for what he has done. As I was doing my studies one night, this is what God showed me as I was asking, why did you die for us? And how, Father God, how could I ever repay that? He said, you can't. But here's the analogy, here's the painting that I want you to paint for everybody. So we're all aware that Eve pulled the fruit from the tree. Has any one of you ever taken an apple and put it back from where you pulled it? It wasn't my background, whether that be physics or science or something, but it's impossible. Agreed? Yes. 
So once we pull that fruit from the stem, who can put it back up? Right? Here's what God showed me. That fruit was pulled from that stem. He, when he died, put himself on the cross, which represents the tree. And he was that fruit. And it was only him that could put himself back up there. Do you all comprehend that? Do you all see the way that he came in and the way that sin entered the world was through the pulling of a fruit from the tree. He put life back on that tree so that you could live. And we talk about all these gods that are out in the world. One of the things that I always ask when people are arguing with me about there are multiple ways to God and I tell them that there's one God. You show me another God who raised himself from the dead. All we have are statues. But there are many gods out there, many prophets. You could go to their tombs. Their bones are probably there, dried up. The God that I serve is the only God where the tomb was open. There was no body in there. So you show me a God that can put life back on a tree. Until you do, I only serve one God, and that name is Jesus Christ. Let's move on. How do we have a new me resolution? First, as I mentioned, we must know why we serve him and what he did for us. Are we all in agreement now that we could not put that fruit back? Is there anybody that feels otherwise? So we're all in agreement. This is my first time up here, but I think it's supposed to be amen when you're in agreement. Right, Pastor? Amen. Right, Pastor? Am I wrong? Amen. Thank you. Especially for my wife. <laughs> Don't get yourself in trouble, brother. <laughs> we are in a losing battle. We hide that statistic in, in the numbers because many people identify themselves as just Christians. But what is true Christianity? Because the Christianity that I know wouldn't allow certain things in the church today. The Christianity that I know wouldn't conform the church to the lifestyles of the people outside of the church. Right? That's the Christian that you two taught me. Be uh -huh. be 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 right? That, that's the Christianity that Pastor Kilby taught me at the age of 13. Right? We, we begin to accept things because, because we don't want to offend. Right? I remember growing up in here being 13, 14, I couldn't wait to get my ears pierced. I couldn't wait. But I was taught something again. Paul said, if eating meat offends my brother, then meat I shall not eat. And it wasn't a judgment thing. It was my spirit that I was saying it may offend some in the church. Watch the way you walk. Watch the way you talk. Watch the way you carry yourself. Because people are watching you. And when certain things may be said about you, that may pierce you, that may hurt you, you still watch the way you walk. I'm offend you. Don't worry about your reputation. Because I don't call the abled. I able those I call. Hallelujah. 
So what does God want from his people? We know what he did for us. What does he want from us? Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the I'm glad you know it, but are you doing it? You know it, right? Are you doing it? And what does that mean? We, we, we've lost sight that church church used to be on the corner of the streets without building walls. And that was the best church because as strangers passed, they would see what's going on and inquire on what is God doing. They would want to get a taste of that. But how many of us know that as we walk out of here, and we may be all powered up, I mean, I felt the praise and worship. I listened to all the words, but some of us are going to walk out of here in 30 minutes, forget everything we talked about. Forget all the songs we sang. Go back and start dipping into their troubles as opposed to concentrating on what God is doing. Or what God may have said. That's called evangelizing when we go out and we reach out to people. And we all may not be called to be preachers. What I'm doing this morning is having a conversation. I don't have a title to it, whether it be preaching. I just call it speaking what God has. You know, a lot of us, we, we call pre preachers, um, pastors, deacons, bishops. As Minister Rowe invited me up here, I, I often said no. Because I was so concerned about my abilities as opposed to God's ability to use, to use me. And as I continue, and as I focused on that, Amen. God showed me Saul. God showed me Saul. Then he showed me Ananias. And that's who a lot of us are. Because what Ananias saw was Paul, was Saul's past. So God had blinded Saul on the road to Damascus because he was on his way to what? Persecute Christians, right? He stopped them on that road. And he said, why are you persecuting me? Now God had already died. Saul, I don't believe, had ever met him. But God said, why are you persecuting me? What that painted for me was that when I persecute a brother or sister, or when I don't treat a brother or sister the way that God intends for me to treat them, I'm doing the same thing to God. When I walk out of here and see a brother or sister struggling with something, and then I call another brother and sister in the church and gossip about it, I'm gossiping about God. When I'm too busy to see that a brother or sister can't pay their rent and instead judge them and said, well, you need to be a better steward of what is God giving you and not know the circumstances, I'm judging God. When we see children out of wedlock, whatever the case may be, we don't know what the person's going through, but we're quick to judge. You see, the whole time that Paul or Saul was persecuting Christians, God was doing something in his life. God allowed him to see what a persecuted Christian looks like to foreshadow what he was going to go through. And in spite of knowing what he was getting ready to go into, he accepted the call. So how many of you in here are Saul and God is calling you, but you're so ashamed of your past that you refuse the call. Those are the ones that I want to talk to about a new me resolution. Those of us that are Saul's, those of us that have a, a crummy past, 
And I want to go back and mention again, Bartholomew said, can anything good come out of that? So no matter what your background is, what your neighborhood may have looked like, what your sins are, God has something for you. And God wants to use you today. You know, I was reading something and it said, there's no magic wand that's waved over us from the 31st to the 1st. But we all have these grand New Year resolutions. And again, if you're like me, it lasts maybe two, three weeks. If you're better than me, six weeks. <laughs> That's my guy right there. We have a great relationship. Right? How many people in here have held on to their New Year's resolution year after year? We got a couple? Right? So how do we stay committed this time, starting today? Because when we say that we'll do it tomorrow, Bishop Bro, again, is that is that boasting? Because we're taking control and saying we control tomorrow, right? Right? So when God gives a vision and tells us to do something today and we sit on it, we're in control of time as opposed to him being in control of us. We may not say it with our words, but I know you all have grown up on this. Actions speak louder than words. We used to believe that God was omnipotent. Omnipresence. Omniscient. But yet in the church we act a certain way and outside of the church we're completely different. So how is God omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent? But yet our attitude inside the church changes as soon as we walk out the walls. Because we respect the four walls. We don't truly respect God. There, my wife and I, we're, we're in the early stages, even though it's been 10 years of our marriage. We're still learning each other. But I'm reaching this place as I get closer to God, where something sort of turns in me. If I don't humble myself and go apologize. And I may stay there, turn, twirl, and I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it because she's wrong. I'm not wrong. She's wrong. <laughs> I am not wrong, God, this time. <laughs> but it's not about me. Exactly. If you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it. confess our shortcomings. When we confess our shortcomings, we allow ourselves to see others in a different light. We no longer carry ourselves as this perfect individual who looks down at everybody else and sticks our chests out. God wants somebody that is truthful versus somebody that only acts in the presence of others. I think those are called Pharisees and Sadducees. Is that, is, and that's who Jesus sort of on pegs with, isn't it? Because they would act one way, they would talk one way, but then outside of it, they were all, they weren't aligning. They're, they're aligning what he wanted them to align to, right? They, say that again, who was that? Mm, I didn't say it. I'm not allowed to say that up here my first time. But can you say that one more time since I can't say it? I didn't say it. Amen. So we must confess our sins before God and not be too proud to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. 
I need you to make in me a clean heart. Renew within me a new spirit that my life can be righteous and that I can hear from you clearly. Because when sin holds, when sin holds us down, we can't hear truly from God. Because we're battling the sin. So once we confess, it is only at that point that we can conform our lives. There's no conformity without confession. So we must confess, and then after we confess, God then conforms us to His likeness. When He conforms us to His likeness, we learn how to commit. Commit to what He has for us to do. To commit ourselves to doing what He wants us as opposed to what we want to do. My generation seems to think that the Bible should conform to our lives mm -hmm. as opposed to us conforming to the Bible. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you're right. For time purposes, I won't go into all the scriptures and texts that I have here, but basically, it says God's word was the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. In the beginning, the word was with God, the word was God, and everything that was made was made through him. So if that's what the word says, why is that today we live a life where if the preacher sort of says something that doesn't align with what we believe, even if he's pulling from the text, we get offended. As opposed to saying, God, is that me? If it is, help me to conform and show me how to commit to you. But as opposed, we're going to set up here. I can't believe Minister Rose said that, man. <laughs> he knew I was struggling with that thing. He's going to put me out on blast like that. <laughs> and that used to be me. I used to have my head down. But Pastor Kilby said one word I remember. One word. And some of you know I'm Haitian, so my English is not that well. So when he gave me the word resilient, I was like, I don't know that word. I gotta go look that up. So I went home, pulled out my dictionary, and it talked about an individual that perseveres, that moves on, that endures. An individual that falls but gets back up again, doesn't give up. And that word always stuck with me. One word. I need to be resilient if I'm gonna follow God. Because people are gonna put me down. People are going to talk about me. People are going to look at my shortcomings. But I need to be resilient. Because it's not me. I'm not able. But he enables me. But that's not just for me, church. You're not able. It's not about you. When are you going to believe that he enables you. Mm -hmm. Are you doing all that you need to to make God happy? Yes. Or is your life simply about pleasing yourself? Yes. What is the first thing that grabs our mind when we wake up in the morning? Yes, right. Be honest with yourself. Right. But again, the Holy Spirit is stronger than you are. So he's talking to you when you wake up in the morning and he says, Lord, feet, get up, get on your knees and pray. Uh -huh. But God, you know I got to get these kids ready. This morning, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late to the job that you provided me. So I cannot pray right now instead of I should have gotten up earlier to do the prayer, but now I have a reason why I cannot do it. Because I can't make the sacrifice to cut back on my sleep. I need my sleep. I need to feel comfortable. I, 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 I. It's a new me resolution. 
you, 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 and you. Once you commit, it is only at that point that you could comprehend the commission. SK tu pun kau pun sama macam punya. No, I'm not. That's how it is when you don't commit. It's like God is speaking another language. Everybody in there like what? What he say? I know you know Sister Pierre. <laughs> but to everybody else, it's a foreign language. Because we've not confessed. And because we've not confessed, we've not conformed. And because of the lack of conformity, we don't commit. And because we don't commit, how can we know the Word of God? I wish Brother McLeod was in here today. He taught me my first scripture. Joshua 1 verse 8. Do not. It's not a suggestion. Contrary to what some of you may believe. It's not a suggestion. It doesn't start out by saying if you feel. It said do not let this book of the law. Now a law is something that we follow, correct? Now the law of the land, if we break that law, there are consequences, right? So follow me again. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. You must meditate on it. Is it sometimes? Is it when you feel like? Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. You must meditate on it day and night. And it goes on to say, then you will be prosperous and have much success in all that you do. Some of us right now are burdened. We're going through financial struggles. We're going through relationship struggles. People are talking about us. We just feel like the world is holding us down. But if he said, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth and you were doing it, you would also know the passion that says, cast your burdens and your cares on me. Amen. So you're walking around with this big bag like you Santa Claus when you could have dropped it. And if you trusted God, he would have picked it up. God is good. So we must confess, we must conform, we must commit ourselves, and after we commit ourselves, we could comprehend the commission to go. Going back to Saul and Ananias, Ananias questioned God when he told him to go talk to Saul. But God said, go. I am going to use him as an instrument. You see, Ananias didn't comprehend God's plan. But he followed what God had said. And the same for us. We may not understand why God has taken us through some of the things that he's taken us through. As grateful as I am to, to, um, to the Kilbys for allowing me to live in the parsonage when I didn't have a home. <laughs> As embarrassed as I was to walk in the church sometimes, because I didn't have family. As much as I hated my life, I can say praise be to God. Sometimes you don't know how God is going to use us. And if I didn't go through some of the things that I had gone through, I would not know of His power. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I don't shed tears for the loss of my mother or the loss of my father at a young age. 
I shout for joy because that, that put me in a place where I truly know that I can rely on God. No matter what I'm facing, no matter what the obstacles are, no matter the difficulty, and I'm human, I fall short. But I know where my power supply is. I'm like a battery. I lose charge. But Jesus is my power supply. My very final point <coughs> is to follow Christ. Yes. Mm. We comprehend the commission, but sometimes it can get a little foggy. Yes. Sometimes we can't see through it. <coughs> but we just keep our eyes focused on Christ. Mm. I started this this conversation, this message with you all about following God and how God is wonderful. So I ended the same way. For us to have a new me resolution, we, have, we must remember that God is the perfect example. There is not one thing that you are facing in your life that he, that he didn't see. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the, girl, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There was nothing that was created that was not made through Him. So He made you. He understands you. You are His workmanship. He is the craftsman. When things break in the house, who do you call? The workmen that put it together, right? So God is the workmanship that puts your life together. And we're all going to have cracks and bruises. But we look to everybody else to fix the cracks and bruises. It's a lot of us. But Jesus is the only thing that can mend the broken hearted. So join me. Join me today. Unlike everybody else that's waiting until tomorrow to kickstart their new year resolution. The fact that you have breath and that you have life. The fact that God has you here this morning. You may have woken up, you may have said, I don't feel like going today. I've been there. You may be troubled when you walked in. But God is saying, confess. Through your confession, conform. After you conform, commit. After you commit, then you will comprehend the mission and the commission that I have for you. And if you don't know how to make it through the mission, follow Christ. Amen. Follow Christ. Oh, yeah. Thank you all so much for this opportunity to share with us. I pray that you all will have a new me resolution.